to do is talk uh, indeed about the asylum uh, procedure and the regulation, but also between the interplay of the different uh, uh, new regulations which are coming out, and look particularly at the procedural aspects. And um, so I'll tell you a bit about what's out there, what's coming, but also um, the way that it might evolve if this actually comes into force and what effect it will have on your national, uh, um, uh, um, national uh, jurisdictions. Because, uh, as we have heard this morning by the wonderful presentations uh, of the Commission particularly, um, um, it is quite clear that uh, the situation at the moment is in a deadlock. And um, this deadlock uh, also means that um, it seems like uh, in order to get out, the lowest common denominator is the one that everybody is going for, and it does raise the question, for example, how does, it, how does it meet up to the standards that Luxembourg has set in the past? Right. Um, uh, I will just quickly take you through uh, the reforms of the <coughs> Common European Asylum System, uh, particularly the timeline and structure of the asylum procedure regulation and the different chapters, and uh, also I... I end my slides with some background information uh, on, on this issue. Um, again, I'm just highlighting what we saw in the other uh, um, um, recast of the of SEAS, that everything was done with great haste due to uh, what they call the tsunami of asylum seekers or mass influx, and I'm not putting down the problems that were there and the urgency to do things, but it does uh, it is important to keep in mind that the time element is, is, is crucial because reforms of SEAS uh, or the proposals were done at the time at the height of the refugee uh, influx and that situation is simply not there anymore. Now, we can muddle along uh, at the moment with, the, with these uh, proposals or particularly given the fact that most of you are active in national jurisdictions and particularly given the fact of the mass uh, volume of questions at the moment being raised in preliminary form to Luxembourg, whether we should adopt any of this at all. I'm not saying we shouldn't, I'm not saying we should, but it is an important question. Because, you know, for me as a practitioner, uh, and it doesn't really matter on what side, if you want to call it side, you work on, uh, to keep up with what's happening in Luxembourg means that you have to read every week or every two weeks lots and lots of case law. And, you know, um, I have genuinely the idea that uh, there's only so much reform and adjustments that national administrations can, can undertake, um, uh, let alone all of this coming out. So I do think it's an important question uh, to raise. And although the introduction of a regulation has been welcomed by most stakeholders in general because it sets common standards, binding standards. Some EU members actually have higher standards. And that's something that wasn't raised and they will be compelled to lower the standards. Now, is that really something that we strive for? Right, so let's take a look at uh, where we stand at the moment. <coughs> The proposal um, the, it has gone through all the necessary steps, um, both including the Commission and the EP. And uh, at the moment, uh, the report was tabled on the 22 of May 2018 um, for plenary and single reading, which means that at the moment, um, we're, it's still up in the air how it will actually work out. I'm just going through these quickly because this morning they're already covered. Um, the objectives, I think it's important to look at. Uh, the replacement of the Asylum Procedures Directive with the regulation, again, establishing a fully harmonized common EU procedure for international protection and reduce differences in recognition rates from one member state to the next. Um, in that sense, one does have to question whether these objectives are actually practical, realistic and feasible if we've just heard the vast differences uh, from Fabian of rec recognition rates. And not just between 
uh, uh, the different countries, but also between refugee status and subsidiary protection, which then plays out in the asylum, asylum procedures regulation quite differently. So if we are aware of the fact that there is already such a vast difference, um, <clears throat> will these objectives actually be met by uh, making the regulation go into force? Uh, but I would propose to you, and I've done this on purpose, that I will start with the, um, in all of the subjects that, I, that I'm dealing with, the positive developments and then the concerns. Grave concerns, little concerns, big concerns, but we'll start with the positive developments. So if you bear with me, we'll get to the, to the good bits also. Right. One of the objectives or aims is to simplify, clarify, shorten the asylum procedures and to ensure common guarantees for asylum seekers and harmonization uh, of rules on safe countries, which also uh, uh, brings in a lot of issues which we'll talk about later, but to ensure stricter rules to combat abuse and discourage secondary movement. Just for argument's sake, just imagine that you're an Afghan, you've got a family, small kids, you're stuck on Lesbos in Moria, for a year, two years, three years. And finally, because of the grave risks which are there, and which, is, uh, which are well documented, I mean, this is no dispute on the reception conditions there, you decide to move on. And then you get hit over by the head due to the asylum procedures regulation. Why? Because you are abusing SEAS. Now, if you actually end up in the Netherlands, I think I might have a pretty good case to say this is not abuse. This is the EU not meeting up to the standards it sets. And if that is the situation, I have no other alternative than to move on. And then again, just for the argument's sake, um, these are not DHL packages that we're dealing with. We're dealing with individuals. And I think it's always important to remember that, despite the snazzy gra graphics and so forth. These are individual people who are in need of protection. However, uh, the layers that the EU puts on the decision making before we get to the merits of if they need protection or not are huge. And again, <coughs> that's where uh, the problem or the challenge of safe third countries come in. So. Um, it is, I think, a question which should be raised, and I know it doesn't sound very comfortable to raise this question, but somebody needs to do this. It just happens to be me today, but you know, these are important questions also for policymakers to, to, to bear in mind. Right, the structure of the asylum procedures regulation is as follows. <coughs> we have six chapters, and as usual, chapter one, general provision, chapter two, basic principles and guarantees, with five subsections, the rights and obligation of the ap applicants, personal interviews, provisions on legal assistance and representation, special guarantees and medical examination. So here we see the layers of, uh, uh, of the outset, if you want to call it that. And chapter three deals with the administrative procedure, which is the access to the procedure, the examination of, uh, of the procedure and decisions on applications, special procedures, and now we're talking accelerated border procedures, safe third country concepts, which is very big in chapter five of, uh, or section five of chapter three, the withdrawal and the appeals procedure and final provisions. Right, um, if we go to general provisions, um, one, the recital seven in article two one deals with the scope. In other words, the territory, the border, territorial waters, and transit zones. However, uh, it does seem from this, uh, um, from this proposal for the regulation that there are no obligations for search and rescue in international waters. What happened there? I mean, these are substantive, positive uh, rights of people who, who are in need of rescue under marital law. How does that meet up with this, uh, uh, with this situation? So I'm just flagging it out that that might be something that will be potentially litigated. 
And if a fish vessel does indeed discover a sinking ship, what is it supposed to do according to the Asylum Procedure Directive? It doesn't give an answer. And how, in that sense, is Article 2.1 to be equated to Article 1 of the ECHR? Because the European Court is quite clear. Once you have jurisdiction, you have responsibility. And you can't, in the, in the cases of Medvedev versus France, uh, Elsa Skeny versus the UK, I can put them up later, uh, Georgia versus Russia from 2008, don't all of these situations apply anymore? In other words, we have the Hirsiyama, which was the Grand Chamber decision on, on uh, 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 international rescues at sea, and D and NT, which was decided by a uh, small chamber, which is now pending at the Grand Chamber. Pardon? And was heard last week. Thank you, Nula. Um, which is on Chita, if I say it correctly, Maria, the small enclaves of Spain in Morocco. And all of these are already uh, 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 seriously, or these, these are being challenged at the European Court in Strasbourg. <coughs> now, better safe than sorry, one would have thought that they would have had a broader definition of the scope. However, it is, uh, uh, I think, uh, something that... Uh, um, that seriously has to be rethought out because otherwise we will spend years litigating this. And I'm a practitioner, so I could have a field day. You know, I could do lots of litigation. But uh, you know, for the sake of my clients, I don't think that's a good idea. A second problem is the responsible authorities. There's one determining uh, authority. However, if you look, for example, at MSS or NSNME, which were the Dublin cases going back <coughs> to Greece, Belgium was held responsible and was found in violation of Article 3 by the European Court, not just Greece. So would, how will that play out under the new uh, uh, general provisions? Again, I don't have an answer because, uh, and also keep in mind that this uh, uh, regulation has not yet been uh, uh, come into force, but I, was, I would hope that the Commission and all other stakeholders involved in drafting uh, um, or in advancing the, the development of the regulation keep this in mind because we will have to litigate this as, as uh, practitioners and it will just lead to more delays. Um, ah, the first positive development. <laughs> there is one. Um, one of the most positive developments is the strengthening right for applicants to information. Article 8, Recital 25. In a language which they understand or are reasonably meant to understand of their rights and obligations throughout the procedure. I don't know what reasonably means to understand. If you understand, you understand. But if you don't understand, then you can't indicate that you don't understand and so forth. Um, the extension of the right to free legal assistance and representation to all stages of the asylum procedure, I think, is a real, uh, uh, very, uh, a very big step forward, uh, which is covered by Article 14 and 17. Um, however, uh, um, as the uh, MSS and, uh, and also the Rahimi case made clear, that no means of paying for a lawyer and no information of organization or offering legal assistance actually in itself constitutes a violation of Article 3 and 13. And also the DEB case, uh, which is also, I think, important, that procedural rules should not limit EU rights, e.g. not eligible for legal aid and not being able to afford legal uh, costs uh, fall under the principle of effectiveness. In other words, there, there are clear benchmarks in which uh, we will have to see how uh, the operational side of the regulation works out. But if this is the, the standard that we're looking at, <coughs> it is, uh, I think it's important that the right of free legal aid is in all stages. And please remember, don't do it for the asylum seeker. Do it for your own national system. Why? Because uh, I know lawyers can be uh, difficult uh, and, all right, or very difficult, but um, they also enhance the quality of the decision-making because they can inform the asylum seeker 
what documents are needed. They can inform the asylum seeker that his case doesn't stand a chance because he's an ecological refugee and in a new, better world that might be grounds for recognition. But so far, the 1951 convention has not been amended and so forth. So you can do a bit of expectation management as a lawyer, which means they might have other options, you know, try family unification or try something else. So <clears throat> lawyers are crucial to make sure that the procedures run uh, smoothly and that all the information which is out there uh, uh, is actually brought to the table. And um, um, the idea that there's sort of this antagonism between uh, uh, immigration authorities and lawyers, I think, is very, very 70s and outdated because we need each other in order to make sure that for us lawyers, we represent our clients well, which means that we have to cooperate well with the immigration authorities and vice versa. Right, so um, another issue which I think I need to flag out is the further specification and reinforcement of the obligation for member states to systematically identify persons in need of special procedure guarantees as soon as an application is made, which is covered by Article 19 and 22. And that ties in, I suppose, with the reception conditions uh, uh, presentation that uh, Nicolas Jacobs and Ulrich uh, gave this afternoon. And also with, so all of these provisions are, 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 uh, have an interplay between them. So these are the good bits. Concerns. Now they're just as long as the, as the good bits. Um, the compulsory list, no, oh yeah, sorry, I have to go back to one. Um, Article 4 I, I did not cover, uh, uh, and that is um, the um, crucial role that under the uh, uh, Asylum Procedures Regulation, the difference may, is between uh, registration and lodging of an application. And these are not well defined. I don't know if anybody knows why these are not well defined, but I'm guessing that there could not be any consensus on this. But if the whole system is hinges on the difference between uh, the actual registration and the lodging of an application, uh, then um, it is very hard to see that if we are all using different sets of definitions on this, I'm sure that uh, uh, that will come out in the procedure and it seriously undercuts the aim um, <coughs> in which systematic identification of persons in need but also of persons uh, per se is already in, uh, uh, out there. Right. Um, basic principles and guarantees are covered by Article 7 to 24. A compulsory list of obligations that applicants have to comply with and sanctions in case of non-compliance, such as considering an application as implicitly withdrawn and withdrawing automatic suspensive effect, which is Article 7, 7.3 and 54.2 and C. These are the people who don't, uh, uh, um, who either abscond or might have been placed administratively in another center. However, this, the, 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 um, uh, uh, the practice is that uh, occasionally not all the registrations are done timely. So, you know, if he has to go to a meeting or an interview and they send it, the invitation to the wrong uh, 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 asylum reception center and so forth. All of these problems are lumped on the individual asylum seeker. And how does that work out uh, with regard to Article 41 of the Charter, where there's a clear uh, uh, indication and norm in which good administration should take place? In other words, I don't have a problem per se with people who are absconded and after you've done a genuine search, they're not there anymore. My problem is with people who, by no fault of their own, are suddenly uh, find themselves out of an asylum procedure without a lawyer, without a translator, and they don't know how to get, get back in. Article 7.3 says that the obligation to provide details necessary for the examination of the application is, uh, is a concern uh, and they have to do that immediately. Um, and the question is, is this at variance with uh, two, I think, big grand chamber decisions, FG and JK uh, and others versus Sweden. FG, the burden of proof on the applicant 
but also the member state should, out of their own motion, do investigation. How will that uh, uh, work out with regard to Article 73? And the other JK case, authorities should take into account all the difficulties which an asylum seeker may encounter when collecting evidence abroad. Um, and lastly, the uh, CJEU decision MM versus Ireland, the member states should actively cooperate with the asylum, with the applicant. However, on the Article 73, I'm a bit scared because it does not seem that there is a, a, a big legal or strong legal obligation for the state to do anything because details necessary for the examination are all placed on the uh, burden of the applicant. So the state can remain passive. It should not want to stay passive, but if it does, the regulation doesn't help the individual asylum seeker make sure that his story is fully covered in the, uh, and also not brought to the court. So if you're a judge, you will have to become even more active at a hearing, which will take more time and so forth. So in my opinion, it should have been better to, to, in, to take the good or to take the, the, uh, the, the, the need for cooperation on the MM and have that as the, as the, as the setting of the standards rather than Article 73. Um, <coughs> Another issue is the merits test for legal assistance, i.e. the possibility to exclude free legal assistance in cases in which the applicant or the appeal are considered as not having any tangible prospect of success. Now, um, this is another layer. If the applicant did not have a translator or, or a language he m reasonably could understand, simply because he, you know, he might be from a country the size of Europe, uh, and there are quite a few countries which are that big, if you look, for example, at Sudan, and you have the small pockets where they speak specific languages in, uh, in, 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 in Sudan, he will not have had a chance. In other words, all of the information which is necessary, and he's coming, for example, from a, from a prima facie 15C-like situation, or 15B, has not come out. He has a problem getting a lawyer or legal assistant. And then uh, when he does try to get legal assistance, the, the, there, are, there is a fair chance that uh, um, he will not get it because uh, the case does not have tangible prospect of success. However, you can only come to that conclusion if all the standards before that have actually taken place. <coughs> and also, it does call in, uh, into question whether it is not, uh, whether it's at odds with, for example, Singh versus Belgium, or say, G versus Belgium, again, MSS, Rahimi also. Uh, a full and extensive review of possible violations should take place, as per Article 13. And you can't have a full and extensive review if you don't have a lawyer and you don't know what the law uh, 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 entails for you in a specific country. And um, this is not just a concern out of uh, um, this, no. This isn't not, this is not just Strasbourg. This is also Luxembourg. If you look at uh, Marx and Spencer case, which is an incredibly old case, nothing to do with asylum, which underlines the, effect, the need for an effective legal protection. It's simply an issue. So how to equate the right to legal information to legal assistance uh, with uh, Article 8.2 and the standards set in Luxembourg and Strasbourg? Uh, I told you that we'll get to positive developments once in a while. They're, they're little hurdles that we can, that we can take. Um, let's have a look. Uh, Oh yeah, there was, there was one thing that I need, that I wanted to, um, to, to emphasize that uh, in January of uh, this year, there was again a, uh, a, a violation of Greece in a case called JR versus Greece, in which the court highlighted the need to provide detailed legal information. But if you're this Afghan family on Lesbos and you've got two kids who are sick and you are getting sick, and you need to get detailed legal information which you need to digest in order to be a meaningful participant in your own procedure, how are you going to do that without legal uh, assistance? You will need somebody to translate it into layman's terms. 
Uh, however, you must know or you must get the gist of the, uh, of the uh, detailed information in order to actively participate. So that's why this morning I sort of hassled the, the lady about, you know, give us some money for pro bono work on Lesbos or anywhere else. And no, don't just do it for the asylum seekers because the lawyers are not getting rich by it because they're doing it for free. But just this is, uh, I think, a primary EU uh, 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 obligation that if you enact legislation which is then enforced by member states and somehow some member states uh, uh, have a difficulty meeting up with these standards then the EU should step in. I, don't, I, I, I fail to see a rationale for uh, funding of Frontex and EASO but not for lawyers, I just don't see it. But if anybody wants to uh, open up the debate uh, <laughs> then you're more than welcome. Um, oh yeah, I was positive development. Stay, stay focused on positive development. Um, uh, let's have a look. The sp uh, specific requirements that need to be fulfilled for the determining authority may to consider a country sufficiently protection for the purpose of applying the concept of first country of origin. Article 44.2. Um, specific requirements is, I think, uh, something that follows from the mere fact that it's a regulation. You can't have uh, uh, Belgium saying that Pakistan is a safe uh, first country of, uh, of asylum and the Netherlands saying it isn't. So there needs to be a clear harmonization. And you can only get harmonization if you get specific requirements. However, for example, in my own uh, country, in the Netherlands, we are big fans on creating first country of asylum and uh, safe third countries and so forth. Uh, which means that we now enter into a situation, for example, whereby, uh, uh, well, Pakistan is a good example. Uh, there might be some questions on the rule of law in Pakistan, but in general, for, ev uh, uh, for uh, the average asylum request, that does not make the country uh, unsafe. Uh, and then you immediately see the legal assumptions kick in which means that the burden of proof is a lot higher, it's very difficult to, 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 to prove that in this specific situation, even if you're a Christian uh, from Pakistan or something, it's very difficult to actually get the case heard on the merits because you first have to deal with all of these, I would call, uh, uh, preliminary obstacles in order to get to why does this person need protection. Uh, Morocco, safe. First country of uh, first country of asylum it's safe, except for uh, LBGT. Uh, the, the, I missed. I probably missed one. But uh, I thank you. Yes, um, uh, and so forth. So what you see is that the whole concept that a first country of asylum is safe is being nibbled at and taken little chunks of until you you do come uh, you know back to the question. And as a lawyer, you know, I first start litigate about that country. So we're first litigating uh, and having a discussion on whether that country is a, a good first country of asylum or not, and then you get down to the individual merits of the case. And ECRA has been quite clear. It said uh, they uh, propose to delete uh, protection in a third country, uh, same as required per EU law, as international protection uh, uh, or to adapt an effective protection element into, into, into the story because it simply means that you're doing more procedural elements and never getting down to the actual individual case. Uh, the mandatory, another positive development is the mandatory appointment of a guardian for unaccompanied minors within five days from making an application triggering off the time limit for lodging asylum applications by an unaccompanied minor only for the appointed guardian has met with the child. Um, I think there you do see the true strength of a regulation. You know, there's no variation in this. This is what you've got to do. Um, and the continuation of a designation as a, as, a, as a guardian is a very positive element. The number of unaccompanied minors that may be in charge of at the same time has been covered today, 30 by a natural person. <laughs> and measures of supervision and monitoring of the quality of the performance of their task, I think is also important because I think Ulrich already mentioned 
the quality varies, if I can put it diplomatically, uh, of the guardians. And uh, their presence and role during personal interviews, I think, is also very important to highlight. We can see that interviews done without the Guardian president uh, uh, are sometimes shorter, more brief, while if they are actually the mere fact that they are present there uh, makes, it, uh, uh, makes it a positive uh, development. Um, concerns. Um, again, it's been mentioned, I think, before uh, by Fabiana, but the compulsory use of safe country concepts. Um, before family links or the best interest of the child are concerned, I think, is a very important issue. Um, because, again, you will see that Luxembourg uh, has already set the standards, particularly for children in the best interest of the child and family links and Article 47, simply means that you must have uh, address to an uh, effective legal remedy. Now how that works out uh, as compared to a, uh, a compulsory use of safe country concepts is not clear to me because hey, people from different nationalities marry and you know, why should their rights under uh, uh, the rights of the child or family rights be encroached simply because your mother has got a different nationality or your father. Um, so the recast of the Asylum Procedures Direction um, uh, also makes possible the optional use of safe country concepts. Uh, optional use, so it's not compulsory. And ECRA has said that lowering of protection standards of EU law uh, uh, is one of their concerns and uh, given the more complexities in the member states. So that is something that uh, should be dealt with. Um, safe third countries, another issue is no sufficient connection that needs to exist between the applicant and the third country. Mere transit being enough. Recital 37 and 45.3. So we have this Christian, who's from Pakistan, travels through Iran. Or we'll find a country, Turkey obviously is the most safe country at the moment that we can think of. Seriously, it is, according to the Commission. So we can send all of them back, not just under the EU-Turkey deal, that's another layer of decision making we're making, but under this new regulation, uh, uh, regulation we can also send them back as Turkey is a safe third country. Merely because he travelled through Turkey, otherwise how is he going to get to Europe? In other words, um, if all of these regulations come into place and we're looking at the administrative procedures, all of your national procedures will be made more heavy. It won't enlighten your task, it will make it more difficult. And if you keep that in mind, uh, I would still say uh, it's better safe than sorry to not put into place these regulations in this uh, current uh, time frame. Because it will not add to greater standards of protection it will lead to an, a bigger burden on your administration and it is very questionable whether this will stand up either primar primarily in Luxembourg because the court in Luxembourg institutionally is always before Strasbourg if your national court he refers gets back and then ultimately Strasbourg has to say on human rights and um, uh, one of the issues I think is which which uh, uh, which, which concerns us most, or me most, is the fact that obviously I will litigate it, or we will litigate it. It will take three, four, five, six years to get it sorted out. But it does not mean that this is right at the moment. Or at least it is open to the suggestion that it should be adopted to do take in the standard case law. Um, ECRA has said, rather than mere transit, a meaningful link should be the threshold based on a case-to-case -case basis including the vulnerability of an applicant you know you can take your LBGI person who has traveled through different countries uh, but has ha also has spent uh, a day in Ukraine and he is from uh, Iraq which is actually one of my clients who happened to travel that way are we going to send back uh, a transgender from Iraq who has already had a 
Uh, his life has been hell all of his life in, uh, in Iraq to the Ukraine because he traveled through it and Ukraine is considered a safe third country. I'm, I'm, these are elements that we will litigate. I'm just flagging out where the, dif the different issues might arise uh, in, in concrete cases. Uh, uh, another, another issue is the compulsory use of inadmissibility grounds. Um, short time limits for lodging an application with the, concerns, with the consequence of considering an application as abandoned in case the time limit is not met. And these short time limits also for lodging an appeal. Again, if you don't have a solid legal assistance in place, these are things that are going to go wrong. And that's why I thought the remark of Fabian was quite helpful uh, this morning uh, when I was badgering the lady from the commission saying, well, look, it is already a, a, a fine balance between the two, between procedural elements and particularly uh, concerning the shortness of the time limits. But you can't have it both. You need to have lawyers in place in order to make sure that these are safeguards and not luxury issues uh, to have a time limit for, for lodging an appeal. And again, you could look at somebody you for Evelyn uh, Dianqua decisions um, and also I am versus France where, where both courts clearly set a standard. And I think it's important to remember that uh, this is something that, uh, that really should, uh, work, should be worked out more properly or more thoughtfully from, a, uh, uh, from, a, from the perspective of the Charter. Under the Charter, Article 18, right to asylum, Article 47, right to an effective remedy. If these are the cornerstones, and that's primary EU law, then there's lots of wonderful environmental, tax law, business law uh, next door, so forth, which we can use and litigate. But do we really want to go down this road? And that is a question I think that should be uh, at least looked at. Uh, and not just uh, uh, um, uh, from a... Uh, from a line which is, or, or from a perspective from, from politics, because that's what we're hearing. Everything that, we're, uh, that is uh, developing now has got this very strong political connotation. However, the EU is based on individual rights also. And we have that charter, and we have uh, uh, um, uh, procedural elements and safeguards in EU law that can be used. So um, you can't. You can't have an EU based on, on individual uh, rights, uh, but on the other hand, treat asylum seekers like DHL parcels and think you can get away with it. Um, another thing that I would like to flag out is the explicit safeguards to guarantee non refoulement in cases where an application is treated as implicitly withdrawn as being removed. <coughs> that is, I think, Article 39 compared to Article 28.2, uh, third indent of the current uh, Asylum Procedures Directive. That's another concern that should be taken away, I think. Ah, positive developments again. The obligation to translate documents relevant for the appeals procedure, I think, is a really st a big step forward. Um, in many member countries, it's up to the individual asylum seeker to, to uh, provide for translation of documents. But as most of us know, they simply lack the funds to get documents uh, translated. Now, uh, uh, with this new uh, uh, um, um, obligation to translate the documents, I think that will be very helpful. Uh, the manner in which it is translated uh, is not entirely clear. But then again, at least the norm is out there. Uh, and secondly, the full and ex nunc examination of fact and law. Uh, that is a positive development, which also stems from the case law of both Strasbourg and Luxembourg. But how are you going to meet that standard if, for example, again, you know, there are lack of translators, we don't have enough information, uh, uh, the interviews have been very, very uh, uh, short, I mean, I've read the interviews that EASO has done, for example, on Lesbos, and they're not that long, and, uh, and that is an EU's uh, agency doing the interviews. Uh, 
But now we're at the appeal stage. What's a judge going to do? Because he's, he'll be reading a file and he'll be saying, look, there's gaps in the information that I have. Does he have to do that uh, himself every time? Does he, can he, uh, 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 he will spend valuable, a valuable amount of time, which could have been used long, long, long before that in the, uh, in the uh, uh, administrative procedure uh, rather than in the appeals procedure. Right, um, a few other problems uh, in the appeals is suspensive effect, which is Article 54. The asylum procedures uh, regulation uh, will clearly need to be amended due to the consistent case law of Strasbourg and Luxembourg. There's no way around it, and if anybody thinks that they can get away with it, I'd be very interested to know how. But uh, 54, uh, um, 54.1 is quite clear. It says, although in there's a general principle of automatic suspensive effect, yet under uh, sub uh, two and three, most of the procedures that are being dealt with are actually ruled out. So this is a luxury item, automatic suspensive effect, which will probably will only deal with 10 or 15 or 20 percent of the cases if we're looking at it. Why? Because the procedure, border procedures are ruled out, implicit withdrawn of asylum requests, accelerated examination uh, of asylum procedures are also uh, ruled out. So you are stuck with a tiny amount of uh, uh, procedures which are actually dealt with uh, 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 with automatic suspensive effect. Now, in Britain they have a great saying, it's called to put lipstick on a pig. And I think that is about, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's about apt with regard to this. It just simply, uh, you know, it, it, it is gratuit put it in, in French. Um, and also, remember again that if the, if the court has to first rule on suspensive effect, whether it will award it or not, and then rule substantively on, on, the, on the merits of the appeal, what are we doing? We're making, uh, we are overburdening courts and most of the judiciary, like most of the lawyers and most of the immigration uh, 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 officers, are overstretched. Year in, year out, we're overstretched. We're working too hard. And, and anybody who says who he isn't, I dare him to put up their hand. <laughs> but it is a fact that if the politicians don't want to allocate funds to making these systems work, it means that we're all doing this in evening time, in, uh, uh, in our free time. And this will, uh, these proposals or this, or for the regulations will only make things worse. It's not, it's, it's not, you know, what problem are we actually fixing? Because the problem all right, might have been in 2015, 16, and this legislation coming into, into play. So I don't see the advantage of, 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 the, uh, of the regulation actually helping people in the field. Um, critique on the uh, appeals procedure, the submission of new elements during the appeal stage, uh, if relevant for the application and not aware at an earlier stage of, uh, of related to change in his or her situation, it cannot be brought forward. And it undermines the right to asylum, the prohibition of non-refoulement, effective remedy. You can go back to Biankov also, or Singh versus Belgium, which is the Strasbourg case. These are major problems which are not being dealt with or solved, put it this way, by the regulation. The time limits for lodging appeals are very short, one, one week, two weeks, one month. While Strasbourg has consistently uh, considered that uh, appeals, uh, time limits of appeals should be a reasonable period of time and speed of procedures should not undermine procedural guarantees as found in Article 3. This is the IM versus France case. Uh, and again, some by the youth. It should be sufficient in practical terms to enable the applicant to lodge an appeal. And um, it is very, very questionable whether under the, reg under the present regulation, uh, uh, these uh, uh, time limits which are now set will actually uh, stand the test in law, uh, in court. 
Uh, suspensive effect I've already dealt with, um, except for the case called uh, Amadou Toll, which I think is important to flag out as the CJEU judged that Article 38 of the Asylum Procedures Directive must be consistent with Article 47. So if they have said that in, in the Toll case, why on earth are we having a regulation which is at least latently at odds with the Toll judgment and all of these others, if not manifestly? And I found the answer quite disturbing this morning, to be honest, because there it said, well, if there are no, if there's no, what was it, family rights are involved, what, what else did you say, or no fundamental right is concerned, then uh, procedural safeguards simply don't count. We want to we wanna take that out, and we will ignore this, the, the Luxembourg case law, in fact. And um, I don't see how that is possible. Uh, quite honest, I've never, I've never heard of a, uh, a legal doctrine whereby you can ignore standard case law and get away with it. Um, oh yeah, if, well, these are the, uh, the sources of the information that I used, which I thought, you know, it might be handy for you to know. Uh, I mean, I didn't think of uh, up all of this myself, obviously. But... Um, in general, I would just like to conclude that um, if uh, there is so much wealth uh, uh, of legal body in EU, EU law, procedural EU law, procedural asylum EU law, why are we not using the benefit of that to make a system that is practical and effective for all players in, in this field? And uh, I sincerely hope that if I get invited again next year, but I don't know if I'm still invited, that the politicians have left us alone for at least a year or a year and a half to actually work on what is already out there to actually take in what Luxembourg is giving us because that's a challenge enough. And, you know, uh, they're part of the problem nowadays, not part of the solution. And um, the only way out as a lawyer is to litigate, but I would rather see uh, um, enhanced standards of international protection. Thank you.